Ms. Kruger. Can you lean a little bit?
Thank you very much. These are lutes, in case you didn't know that. L-U-T-E, like what um, you would have seen at a Shakespeare opening. So they come from the 16th century.
Thank you very much. You're a very kind audience. I'm going to end with uh, one more piece by Thomas Robinson. And then the main show will start. Good morning. I'm Susie Spickle, your moderator, and I'm pleased to welcome you to the Monadnock Summer Lyceum with today's guest speaker, Matt Meyer Bolton. Before we get started, I'd like to thank today's musicians, Ted Mann and Andrew Schmaus, for providing the music many of you enjoyed while waiting for the live broadcast to begin. Also, thank you to RBC Wealth Management for generously sponsoring today's event and to Agway for the beautiful flowers. For many years, the Monadnock Summer Lyceum has brought outstanding world-class speakers to the Monadnock region to serve as catalysts to inform, engage, and inspire, and an active citizenry on local, national, and global issues. Today's talk is being recorded and will soon be available as a podcast and as a video on our website, monadnocklyceum.org. Programs are rebroadcast on WSMN 1590 AM the next day, Monday at 7 AM, and on WUML 91.5 FM the following Wednesday at 11 AM. Following the presentation, our speaker will answer questions from the audience. Those present in the church may submit questions via the yellow card in the rack in front of you, and an usher will come around to collect them. For those watching virtually, please submit your questions by using the live chat section on YouTube. The Monadnock Summer Lyceum is supported entirely through donations and contributions from our audience and community members. We deeply appreciate your donations, which may be placed in the glass bowls in the church and in the parish hall. Those listening at home may make contributions on our website or by mail. Thank you for your generous support. We encourage you to give us feedback on today's program using the green card in your pew and join our mailing list and or email list. Please drop your green card in one of the glass bowls. For those online, please use our website to provide feedback or suggestions or join the mailing list. After the program, we invite you to attend an informal reception in the parish hall through the door to my right. Our speaker today is Matthew Meyer Bolton. If Nancy Sinatra's song, These Boots Were Made for Walking, is true, then Matt Meyer Bolton must own a pretty darn good pair of boots. How many people do you know whose resume includes minister, writer, educator, part of a team that has won five regional Emmys, member of a gospel bluegrass band, podcast host, creative director for a film company, and lived in a van for a year visiting every single national park. That's a lot of walking. What a privilege I have today to introduce Matthew Meyer Bolton and his talk on nature writing, nature walking. You are all in for a treat. Take it from me, because I have Matt's reviews from the many courses he's taught for the Harris Center, and here's what people have to say about him. 
He's inspiring, charming, engaging, insightful, and scholarly, but very down to earth. Matt Meyer Bolton is clearly no slouch. He holds a master's degree in divinity from Harvard and a PhD in theology from the University of Chicago. He's been a professor at the Harvard Divinity School and seminaries in and across New England and the Midwest. His books include Life in God, John Calvin, Spiritual Formation and the Future of Protestant Theology, and God Against Religion, Rethinking Christian Theology Through Worship. His writing focuses on the simultaneous blessings and pitfalls of religion, the role of spiritual practices in human sorry, in human life, and the way Christianity and other religions can be resources for confronting environmental crises, including climate change and the biodiversity collapse. Many of us in the Monadnock region know Matt as an educator and speaker, catching his talks at places like the Harris Center, Cheshire Academy for Lifelong Learning, and the Monadnock Region Natural History Conference. His talks frequently bring together the sciences and humanities. He is currently writing a book on walking, as well as a related project on seeing the cosmos through the lens of a single American town, in this case, the town of Keene, New Hampshire, where he lives on the slopes of Beach Hill, located near Robin Hood Park. Matt is a storyteller, and this is evident in his most recent work as the creative director at Salt Project, an Emmy-winning nonprofit film production company that he runs with Liz, his partner and work, and in life. SALT has won five regional Emmys and counting. A short list of some of their clients include the Barack Obama Foundation, Maria Shriver's Women's Alzheimer Movement, PBS, Oprah Winfrey's own network, and New York Times bestselling author, Cy Montgomery. This morning, get ready to go on a walk with Matt, who will remind us to brush off our shoes, open the door, and head outside, where the simple act of walking can have the power to transform and connect us to each other and the world around us. Please join me in welcoming Matt Meyer Bolton today. Well, hello, everyone. Thank you uh, very much for that very kind introduction. Uh, thank you to all of you for being here on this lovely day. Uh, thank you to those of you who are watching and those of you who are listening. What I propose we do for the next hour or so together is uh, go for a walk on a cool and dry summer day. How's that sound? <laughs> It'll be a metaphorical walk, of course, but we'll be in good company, some great companions, Henry David Thoreau, the poet Mary Oliver, the writer and farmer Wendell Berry, and the Vietnamese Buddhist monk, educator, writer Thich Nhat Hanh. These will be our companions. These are not for people to trifle with. They are, as Thoreau might say, reformers. They have a critique in mind of our way of life, my way of life, and perhaps yours. And they also have a vision, an invitation, they're putting out a path in front of us, or four paths, and they're inviting us to step on to a new and different kind of path. So that's the first proviso. Keep that in mind. We're listening to reformers, and let's give them a hearing, all right? Uh, the second proviso is I'm going to be using the word walking a lot in this course, or in this, in this course, in this uh, presentation, in this talk. Uh, walking is, of course, bipedal striding over the face of the earth. That's what we typically mean by walking. But I have a broader definition in mind, and I want us to hold that definition as we go along. I mean to include walking barefoot through a landscape and also walking with the support and stability provided by a pair of shoes or boots or snowshoes or a walking stick or a cane or a walker in front of us or a wheelchair underneath us. In other words, we're talking about an ability here, the ability to walk, and therefore we are also talking about disability. And as we make the world more accessible to our friends and neighbors and loved ones who are disabled, we're doing a good thing for the disabled community, but we are all members of that community sooner or later. None of us came into this world knowing how to walk. We learned it. And most of us will spend the last chapter of our lives unable to walk or walking only with great difficulty. So as we make the world more accessible, 
we are doing a philanthropic act for basically all of the human race. So let's keep that in mind as we talk about this ability we call walking. All right, those are the preliminaries. You ready to go? Cool, dry summer day. We're going to find six wildflowers on the walk. The first wildflower, I thought we could start right here in the Monadnock Summer Lyceum. Many of us have come to the Lyceum for years or heard about the Lyceum, or maybe it's the first time you've heard the word Lyceum, but you may not have spent much time thinking about what that word means or where it comes from. And it turns out it has a lot to do with our subject this morning. So what is a Lyceum? Lyceum is a Latin word, but it comes from the Greek, and it was a place just outside of ancient Athens. It was a place that had, we should think not uh, only of a structure or a hall, we should think also of a grounds, gardens, walking paths. There was a temple there to Apollo, and many of you may know that Apollo is often associated with wolves. The Greek word for wolf is lykos, L-Y-C-O-S, L-Y-C-O-S. That's where we get the word lyceum from the, uh, the fact that this place was dedicated to Apollo and Apollo's associations with wolves. So we'll bring the wolves with us on this walk, all right? So already some of our themes are front and center. Religion, Apollo, and the living world, the wolves. But there's another connection. This place, these grounds, already existed when a school was founded there by Plato's most talented student. Uh, Plato had an academy on the other side of Athens, and what do the talented students do? They graduate and they go found their own schools, and that's what Aristotle did, Plato's most talented student. He said, I want to found my school in the Lyceum. I like that as a location. The school was called Peripatos. Peripatos. We had the English adjective peripatetic. The person who is a peripatetic person is a person who loves to walk. And it turns out, so did Aristotle. Now, if I asked you for a picture of learning or teaching, you might give me a picture looking something like this, a hall with people seated and listening to a professor up front. Or maybe you'd give me a picture of a grade school classroom with students in desks and the teacher at the whiteboard or the blackboard. Or maybe a seminar table, people seated around the table, or a library, somebody poring over a book. That's what learning and teaching looks like to us, but not so for Aristotle. Aristotle, we are told, lectured while walking through those paths at the Lyceum. Some of them were covered paths, so we can imagine colonnades behind them. I say them because it was Aristotle and his students coming with him. So he would lecture, and they would listen and discuss all as they walked along those paths. We're also told there were forested areas. We can think of this basically as a campus. So they're walking through the trees, walking past the columns. It's as if Aristotle said, these are important subjects, physics, ethics, poetics. We can't take these sitting down. If we want to engage these great subjects, we have to be at full strength and full stretch. We have to walk. That is the first wildflower for your little bouquet between your finger and your thumb. The idea that learning and wisdom, the cultivation of wisdom, is not a sit-down sport. It is a walking sport. It is something best done, according to Aristotle, no slouch, while walking. Now, we might ask why. Is this just uh, Aristotle's, you know, affectation or a little preference? And one thing we can do, taking a page from his playbook, is look at walking through the sciences, sciences that Aristotle didn't know about, but that we do, such as evolutionary biology. So there is a, uh, just up the road at Dartmouth College, a scholar named Jeremy De Silva, who's just published a book called First Steps, how upright walking made us human. It's a wonderful and interesting argument about how walking is distinctively human. We are the only mammal who walks in this bipedal striding way, which is kind of interesting, and doesn't seem very smart because the top speed of Usain Bolt, you know Usain Bolt, the Jamaican sprinter, the top speed of Usain Bolt is 28 miles an hour, not bad, but the garden variety lion, top speed 50 to 55 miles an hour, makes us upright walkers look like lunch, right, to the uh, predators. 
So there must be some other advantage or set of advantages that would cause us to evolve into walkers. There are many theories, and many of those are outlined in this lovely book, First Steps, so I commend it to you. Just a taste of one of them is that it turns out that walking on two feet is metabolically efficient. We can go farther on fewer calories. So if we are walking a lot, then it would be evolutionarily advantageous to have a way of walking that uses the least energy to go the farthest, and we were walking a lot. When you go back to early humans, even before Homo sapiens, we were hunting and gathering, right? You hear that, that phrase, hunter-gatherer? That's, that's our, our form of society. I like to say gatherer-hunter because most of our calories were gathered. They weren't hunted. There was hunting in there too, though, but we were eating fruits and nuts and tubers. We were doing some scavenging. We were doing some hunting too, but we were walking and walking and walking. There is some resting. There's some sitting, of course, but lots and lots of walking. There's a scholar in uh, Toronto named David, David uh, Samson who has a lovely example. He says, let's take the two million years of Homo erectus, Homo just means human, so it's an upright walking human, two million years of evolution and condense it into a movie. That sounds good. Typical movie, an hour and 40 minutes, so about 100 minutes. So let's take two million years and condense it down to a 100-minute film. You start watching the film. First 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes pass. It looks like a fairly boring uh, nature documentary. You see these small groups of these primates who walk upright, 20 or 30 adults with their children, gathering, hunting, hunting, gathering, walking, walking. This is true all the way through the first hour of the film, the first hour and 10 minutes of the film. This is a 100-minute film. The first 90 minutes of the film, the same social organization, we homo sapiens show up at about minute 85, but with the same social organization, walking, walking. Civilization shifts when we invent a way to control plants and animals called agriculture. Agriculture is invented at minute 99 of the film. There's one minute left in the film and we invent agriculture. 30 seconds left, we invent writing. And just a few seconds left in the film, we experience the industrial revolutions, which leads to more and more sedentary lifestyles, right? Sitting in factories or sitting in offices or sitting at home watching Netflix, right? Netflix appears with a millisecond left in the film. Then we go to credits. Uh, there's a scholar at uh, Duke University, Charles Dunn, who, who calls this evolutionary mismatch. We are made to walk, and yet we've reversed the proportions. We used to sit between long walks, gathering, hunting, hunting, gathering. Now we walk between long sits. At least a lot of us do. And that is an evolutionary mismatch. That's your second wildflower. You are made to walk. Millions of years of evolution, biofeedback systems in you, hormones and chemicals saying to you, yes, yes, walk, this is good, this is how we eat. That's why it feels good when you walk. That's why if you develop a walking practice, your body says, yeah, this is what I'm made to do. That's probably why I submit to you, Aristotle loved to lecture while walking. He may not have understood the evolutionary biology, but he understood that he was fully alive when he was walking. And so did Henry David Thoreau, a speaker who once spoke at this very lyceum, in this very building, I'm told that the pulpit is relatively new, 1870, so new, newfangled pulpit here. But Henry, we, we know Thoreau primarily because of Walden, right? He's the guy who lived in the woods and uh, withdrew from society and was close to nature. But as many of you know, that's not really a very good portrait of Thoreau at all. He would walk into town almost every day. It was a short, relatively short walk into town into Concord at the time. Uh, he lives in his hut or his cabin uh, on Walden Pond for just two years, two months, and two days in typical Thoreauvian whimsy. That was his length of time. And he says it's an experiment. What was the experiment about? He says he wanted to find out if life was mean. By that he means not unkind or cruel, but uh, an older definition of mean, which is something more like shabby or low quality. He wanted to find out if life was mean, low quality, petty, or, here's the contrast term, whether life was 
sublime. Now, he argues in Walden that life is sublime, but what does he mean by sublime? We typically use the word sublime to mean excellent, very, very beautiful, right? But the way that the sublime is developed in the history of Western uh, philosophy includes the very, very beautiful, but also the terrifying. There's beauty and there's terror. Probably the best example of the sublime in this sense is the ocean. The ocean is beautiful, it's gorgeous, right? And also terrifying if we are paying attention to it, right? Or a thunderstorm or an atmospheric river that rains and rains and rains or a heat dome, right? There is, there is this kind of sense of a, the, the sublime is what infuses not only um, things like the ocean, but everything. Thoreau is drawing on his mentor here Ralph Waldo Emerson. There's this famous passage in Emerson's lecture called Nature. You probably know this passage or you've heard of it. He says, consider the night sky, how beautiful it is, how sublime it is, right? The grandeur, the scale, the violence of the supernova, but also the, the, the sheer beauty. Imagine, Emerson says, if the sky were only visible one night out of a thousand years. Think of the impact it would have on us. Think how we would organize our whole life around that one night. We'd tell stories about it, we'd anticipate it, we'd have you know, a festival. But Emerson says, but that same sky on any clear night is visible to us, that same sublimity, that same sense of the sublime, but we don't pay attention. And then Emerson goes one more step. He says, that sublimity is not only in the night sky, it's also down at our feet. It's in the moss and the echinacea blossom and the bee, and the hummingbird. If we have eyes to see, we can see the sublime. Thoreau is saying, yes, I have done the experiment. You don't have to. You don't have to build a cabin by a pond. I have discovered life is sublime. You can read my book. So his method is not to go build a cabin. His method he develops later. The last decade of his life, he's working on this Lyceum lecture. I don't know if he gave it here or not. He debuts it in Concord early 1850s, and then he goes around and gives it at the various lyceums. So he may have given it here in Peterborough. I don't know. I need to talk to a historian here who would know what he talked about when he addressed this lyceum. That lyceum lecture was entitled Walking. He says, I am not healthy. My spirits are not up unless I walk three to four hours a day. Rambling, sauntering, he says, through nature, through the woods typically, but also swamps and meadows and things like that. Now, three to four hours a day, that sounds, from our point of view, that sounds like a lot. But in evolutionary perspective, that sounds about right. That's probably what those gatherer hunters were doing, was walking three to four hours a day, maybe a little bit more. So uh, Thoreau was on to something there. He, by the way, uh, hadn't read Darwin yet, because Darwin hadn't published yet when he starts writing this Lyceum lecture. But he does read Darwin before he dies, before uh, Thoreau dies, and he's an early adopter to the theory of natural selection. It actually inspires him and changes his thinking at the end of his life, the end of Thoreau's life, that is. So, three to four hours a day. How should we walk? He says we should saunter. And then he has this playful etymology, which is undoubtedly false, but he still kind of plays with it. He says it may, he says it may come from this, these roots. And the roots, he says, it comes from is Psalm Terre, the Holy Land. So here we get a sense of Thoreau's version of transcendentalism. So you ask 10 transcendentalists what was transcendentalism, and you get 11 answers. So it's, very, it's, it's, a, it's a vague school of thought. But one of the ideas was that spirit, or God, or the divine, was infused in nature. And the way to access it was to have experiences in nature. By the time Thoreau is working on his essay or his lecture, Walking, he shifted away from the language of sublimity and he's introduced this term. He's used it before, but now he really brings it center stage. The term is wildness. For in wildness is the preservation of the world. You know that line? That's from this essay or this talk on walking. He thinks you should saunter through the Holy Land, saunter the Holy Land, right? He thinks that the Holy Land is right here, right in our backyards, right in the woods and marshes and swamps uh, of Massachusetts and New Hampshire. He had a special place in his heart for New Hampshire. His mother grew up in New Hampshire, in, in Keene, actually. A little plug for Keene. 
Uh, so we, we should be walking a lot. We should be sauntering for the sake of engaging the wild, wildness. Wild animals, of course, but also the wild plants. You can find wildness in the marshes, in the swamps, in the meadows, in the woods, but also between the cracks in the pavement if you have eyes to see. And he says this wildness is the source of your vitality. It will refresh you. In wildness is the preservation of the world, but also your world. So that is his recommendation. That's why we should walk. That's how we should walk. Walk as if walking to and through the Holy Land so that you can engage with wildness for the sake of your own vitality. Now with Mary Oliver, it's a similar move. Mary Oliver lives in Provincetown, right at the tip of uh, the Cape. And Provincetown's on the southern part of that tip. On the northern part is this protected national seashore called the Provincelands. Perhaps some of you have been there. What Mary Oliver would do And you can stand right outside the apartment where she used to live, and you can walk. I've done this myself. I'm a fanboy. You can walk from her apartment building all the way to the province lands. It's about 20 minutes, 25 minute walk. And then you are among the province lands, the woods, the ponds, the dunes, the places in her poetry. I'm sure there are some Mary Oliver lovers in this room, and you probably recognize those places, those geographical places, Blackwater Pond and so on. She brought with her as she walked on every morning, or most mornings, a little pad of paper and a pencil. There's a story that she tells, actually, or she told before she passed, that uh, one day she was out there, she had an idea, she had a pad of paper, but she had no pencil. So the next time she went out, she brought lots of pencils with her, and she hid the pencils in the trees so that she would never be without a pencil. So as a fanboy, my fantasy is to walk those paths, which I have walked, and find a pencil in the crook of a branch. The real test is, would I be able to leave it there? I think I would. I like to think I would be able to leave it there. But this little anecdote helps us to see that she would walk the same paths every time she went out to walk. So she wouldn't only, she wouldn't try a new place. This is, seems important. Okay. Well, this, uh, Mary will help us with the flash flood warning, actually. She was concerned. So she would walk the same paths every morning. So it's a daily walking practice, but the same places, because, she thought, you would see and appreciate and fall in love with those places all the more because you'd see the little changes, the changes of the seasons, but also the changes through the years. Now, she was asked in an interview. She gave very few public interviews, but there's one on YouTube you can watch. She was asked this question, what is a poem? And she gives this amazing answer. She says, I know my poems are considered comforts. They're considered comforting. But what I want is for them to be incendiary. Now, what does she mean by that? She says, in the long run, even poems that are about falling in love with the world, about being amazed by the world, honoring the world, the wonders of the world, they are political in the long run. This is how her work relates to the flash flood warnings. And if you love something, you will take the steps you need to protect it, including the necessary political steps to protect what you love. And if you love the species of the world, the the places, the beautiful places in the world, the wonders of the world, you will take those necessary political actions as the floods rage, as the rains fall, as the heat domes come down, There is a political edge to her poetry, even the poetry that's alluring us into a love affair with the world. And then she says, she takes this little left turn, which isn't a left turn if you know about her walking practice, which now you do. In the same answer, she's answering the question, what is a poem? And then she says, you know, some people, they just, in order to be amazed by nature, they need to go to Wyoming, or they think they do. They go running off to Alaska to have something to honor and be amazed by. And they don't even know what's in their own backyards. 
that there are things to honor and be amazed by in their own backyards. And that, of course, was her practice. She would walk around every morning to see what she could honor and be amazed by in her yard. And then she says, the coup de grace, she says, the reason I do this is to make sure that the place I am in, my neighborhood, is not a place that I understand prosaically. Prosaically. In other words, now, now these are my words, the place that we are in, that she is in, that you are in, is a poem. And so we cannot understand it prosaically unless we misunderstand it. We must understand it poetically. It reminds me of the old creed. I believe in God, maker of heaven and earth. The Greek word behind that word maker, the Greek word is poesis. Same word we get the word poet from, or poetry. So we can say, I believe in God, poet of heaven and earth. That is a very Mary Oliver sentiment. She's influenced by the Buddha in her poetry. She's influenced by Christianity in her poetry. She goes through a period where she writes many Christian poems, explicitly Christian poems. If you're interested in this period of her work, the collection called Thirst is probably the most explicit theological work, but it's woven through all of her work, actually. Which brings us to Wendell Berry. So Wendell Berry wouldn't walk every morning. He would walk on the Sabbath. And as a Christian, that meant for him on Sunday. And he would go out on these Sabbath walks, and then he would write a poem about it that night or the next day, and he collected those poems into what he called his Sabbath poems. So you can go and read those collections. So by doing so, what he was doing was tapping in to a deep, thousands of years old poetry that really may originate in Babylon, perhaps with the ancient Hebrews, this ancient rhythm of seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. 365 days responds to the sun or the Earth's orbit around the sun. The, the month, at least historically, responds to the moon. That's how we get the word month from the word moon, right? But what about seven? There's no natural rhythm that we're responding to with the seven. But seven in many cultures has been considered a sacred number. And it is a kind of way of saying there are rhythms in the world that we can't see, that are invisible to us, but that are nevertheless important. Here's one of Barry's famous poems. You may know it, and it's, I think, apropos of the times we live in today. It's a poem written in the midst of despair, but it is a poem of hope. It's called The Peace of Wild Things. When despair for the world grows in me, and I wake in the night at the least sound for fear of what my life and my children's lives may be. I go and lie down where the wood drake rests in his beauty on the water and the great heron feeds. I come into the presence of wild things who do not tax their lives with forethought of grief I come into the presence of still water, and I feel above me the day-blind stars waiting with their light. For a time, I rest in the grace of the world and am free. Now, those of you with ears to hear will hear Psalm 23 in the background there. I come into the presence of still water. And you'll also hear this ancient tradition of the Sabbath. The Sabbath is a time of freedom. The ancient Hebrews run with this. They say, yes, God created the world in seven days. And by the way, that is a mythopoetic piece of virtuosity. It is not journalism or science. Even for the ancients, it was a poem, a liturgical song in a way. But they say, God rested on the seventh day, and so should you. And not just the seventh day, the seventh year shall be a Sabbath year, the sabbatical year, when the land shall rest and lie fallow. And then the seventh sabbatical year plus one, the 50th year, will be a jubilee year, when all enslaved people shall be set free and all debts canceled. 
The Sabbath is this deep poetry of emancipation, of liberation, but not for its own sake, for the sake of experiencing the grace of the world. The Sabbath says don't work, but that is the, the, the point is to make space for experiencing the wonders of the world, for what's really important, for, in a word, delight. The Sabbath is about freedom and delight. And that brings us to our final wildflower. The Vietnamese Buddhist monk and educator Thich Nhat Hanh, who comes of age during the Vietnam War, he takes a stand against the Vietnam War. He engages in what's called engaged Buddhism, a form of Buddhism that is, he is a monk, but it is fully engaged through acts of compassion for both sides on the war. He ends up in exile in France, where he writes and writes and writes and becomes one of the most celebrated interpreters of Buddhism for the Western world. And much of what he writes about is walking meditation. So you've all heard of meditation, perhaps you practice meditation, perhaps you practice walking meditation, but for most people, meditation is something that you do while sitting. Sitting meditation, focusing on the breath, inhale and exhale. Walking meditation, in a way, is a similar strategy. It's taking a core essential function of the human, that is steps, walking, and using that as the anchor rather than the breath, although sometimes the breath is also included in our attention during walking meditation. So what's meditation for? It's for clearing the mind, focusing the mind, calming the mind. Thich Nhat Hanh's diagnosis of my life, and perhaps yours, is that we are very often preoccupied with regrets about the past, worries about the future, and attempts to get somewhere, to get somewhere else. And Thich Nhat Hanh finds all of these to be distractions. Distractions from what? From the here and now. From the presence of this moment, which is the only moment we have. And so meditation is a practice for letting go of the past, at least for a time. Letting go of the future, the worries about the future, at least for a time. And instead of striving to get somewhere to remind ourselves that we are already here, we are arriving here, here at home. That is the strategy around meditation of all types. But the most common type in the world of meditation is sitting. The second most common type of meditation in the world is walking meditation. You can go and visit the Bodhi tree, you know, where the Buddha sat and achieved enlightenment. It's not actually the same tree, it was a long time ago, but it's a descendant of the tree, it is said, that you can actually see there today. There's a shrine, and then there's a path where it is said that the Buddha did walking meditation. It's a path of 17 steps, so you don't need much. Thich Nhat Hanh would practice walking meditation sometimes when he had five or 10 minutes in a day. When you clear away the distractions, according to Thich Nhat Hanh, the distractions of the past the future, striving to get somewhere. What you enable is the ability to notice the wonders of the present, the wonderful moment of the present. He has this great anecdote where he says, imagine yourself, or it's an exercise really, imagine yourself as a astronaut and you're way out in space, there's no gravity, you're just floating, and then you lose communication with mission control, you realize you're running out of fuel, you realize you'll never get back to earth. Now, of course, you're going to miss your loved ones. But he says, one of the loved ones you will miss is the earth itself. You'll miss the ability to walk on the earth, to set foot on it. You're weightless. You have nowhere to set your foot. And then he says, imagine if you're rescued from that state and you come out of the spacecraft, imagine your joy at just the miracle of walking on the earth. That's the joy, he says, just like Emerson says with the sky, that's the joy that's available to you now, every day. You see the cause for that joy through the exercise and the imaginative anecdote, but it is available to you today. And then he makes one more move. 
He says, not only can we experience joy through the discipline of walking meditation, clearing away the present moment, but we can also be more mindful of suffering, our own suffering and the suffering of others. And we can take up the posture of compassion. And that, he says, joy and compassion, this stance is the most human and humane stance we can take. The stance of being in joy and simultaneously of being mindful enough to be compassionate. So we have four trailheads. On one trailhead is Thich Nhat Hanh, beckoning us to join him. On a path where we can cultivate this human and humane stance of joy and compassion. On another trailhead, there's Wendell Berry beckoning, beckoning us to come. On a Sabbath walk, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, a discipline of walking and writing to help us more deeply connect with this sevenfold rhythm, this ancient sevenfold rhythm of freedom and delight. And then there's Mary beckoning us to come with her on her walk. We don't have to choose. We can do all of them day by day, right? Mary is saying, come with me on a daily walking practice. Bring your pad, bring your pencils, hide some pencils in the trees if you want. Hide them well. And remind, use that practice to remind yourself that you are walking through a poem. Heaven and earth, heaven on earth. And that if you understand that poem poetically, you will fall more deeply in love with the world day by day in an incendiary way that is in the long run political. And finally, on the fourth trailhead is Henry David Thoreau, who's asking us to come for a long, a long walk, three to four hours a day, he would say. But in any case, to engage with the wildness of the world in the swamp, in the woods, in the marsh, but also in between the cracks in the pavement, to refresh ourselves, and always to make walking the enterprise and adventure of the day. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Matt. That was great. I feel like we should just go outside and walk despite the rain. Um, yes. Yeah, we have some time for questions from the audience. For those watching virtually, you may continue to submit your questions by using the live chat on YouTube. While the ushers collect the yellow cards, let me begin by asking you a question. Um, I've been noticing a lot of people walking lately, um, but they are wearing ear pods when they're walking. And I'm just curious about your thoughts on walking with ear pods or walking and being unear podded. <laughs> yes, it's a great question. Um, my own sense is that there's, there's a more interesting answer than saying, oh yes, don't worry about it, plug in your ears. On the one hand, that's not too interesting to me anyway. On the other hand, to say never do it, you know, leave the ear pods behind always, that doesn't seem too interesting to me. I think, I think there's a middle way that's, that is interesting, and I think these four guides can help us that if we are in fact walking with the goals in mind that people like Thoreau and Oliver and Barry and Thich Nhat Hanh give us, then there may be certain circumstances where devices, including AirPods, can be appropriate. But it has to do with the goals. And do, do these devices help us reach those goals? Myself, I love to walk unpotted. Um, because I love hearing the bird song, I love hearing the sounds around me, I, I miss things if, if I'm listening to music. On the other hand, as the musicians reminded us this morning, sometimes I do walk with, you know, Schubert in my ears or, you know, my favorite, you know, U 
you name which uh, music would give you the most lift. And that can be its own kind of beauty. I think the, the real question is, what is the larger goal or the larger project? And that's really the, the question that each of these writers and thinkers and walkers pushes us to consider. Why are you walking? Are you walking just to get the steps, right? Are you walking so you can go ruminate about what you're worried about? So if you keep the goal in mind, and if the goal is salutary, that is, if it, if it leads to our health, then yeah, I think, you know, devices can be a part of that. Um, there are some exercises that people do with their phones where they take photographs of things that they find. So that can be a way of uh, enhancing your walk, right? To give a little record of it. The echinacea blossom, the bumblebee, yeah? So, you know, a pad of paper is a device. A pencil is a device. We can misuse those devices as well as we can misuse digital ones. So I would look for a sort of middle way and ask the bigger questions about what is the goal and is the device helping you to reach the goal? That's my answer. That's great, thank you. Oh, we have some great questions from the audience, um, both here and on online. And there's a question from um, an online viewer and some people here about pilgrimages. And can you comment on the practice of pilgrimage as a walking meditation? Yeah, it's so great. I mean, when Thoreau makes his fanciful etymology about uh, Saint Terre, the Holy Land, he's, he's evoking that, that tradition of, of a pilgrimage to the Holy Land. One of the earliest documents we have in Christian history is a, basically a travel diary from a woman. This is just a couple hundred years or a few hundred years uh, after uh, Jesus dies. And we can tell from her diary what some of the practices of the time were. And already this idea of pilgrimage had, had set in, where you would go to Jerusalem to walk in, and many of you know this term, the Via Dolorosa, the Way of Sorrows, to put your feet in the, the footprint, so to speak, uh, that Jesus walked in. And of course, those, those walks where he's carrying the cross and on his way to the cross, this became a form of piety, a form of solidarity with the founder of the religion, right? So uh, these were pilgrims who would come from far away and go to Jerusalem and walk in those paths, the Via Dolorosa. For some, though, you couldn't get to Jerusalem. It was too far away. And so there were actually replicas of Jerusalem that were built that you could then walk to and walk around and have the same kind of vicarious experience. And that is actually the origin of the tradition, which is in many, especially Catholic churches now, of the Stations of the Cross. So as you go inside a cathedral and you see the Stations of the Cross, all these moments in the story of Jesus carrying his cross to Golgotha, this is around inside the church. So even inside of a cathedral is this notion of a pilgrimage. Of course, pilgrimage cuts across all different kinds of traditions. Um, if you are able, in terms of your health and your means, if you're a Muslim, you're, you're called to make Hajj, right? The, the great uh, pilgrimage to Mecca. And so these are uh, ideas of taking this fundamental human action, the action of walking, and giving it a kind of poetry and significance and allowing us to have solidarity with each other, with other pilgrims. You know, a lot of people go to Spain now and, you know, and do uh, pilgrimages in, in that part of Europe and also other places. It's, it's just a way for us to, like Aristotle, to do something important for whoever, the, you know, the Muslim, the Christian, whoever it is, to do something of great importance and to get our whole body involved, to get all of us into it. And, of course, it creates social connections, too, right? We connect with other pilgrims. So the idea of pilgrimage is really a, a central poetic idea at the heart of many religious traditions. And we can tap into it in our own ways, whichever faith we're coming from. I think in, in different ways, these four writers invite us to do just that. Great, thank you. That was fascinating. Um, here's an interesting question from a person here today. How can you have a profound, can you talk about how you can have a profound experience walking through an urban environment? Yeah. Well, I, I think you can, and I think it's also very important because it gives the lie 
to one of the most important misunderstandings that some of us, myself included, carry around, even in our language, where we talk about nature on the one hand, and then human society on the other hand, as if we are not part of nature, as if cities are not part of nature, right? It's just a termite mound, you know? That's what a city is, right? It's our way of building community. It's just as natural as anything else. Thoreau actually doesn't help us too much here because he, in that essay, the famous essay, Walking, he drives this wedge between human civilization on the one hand and nature. He begins the talk by saying, standing up in this room maybe, he says, I want to put in a good word for nature. You know, I can read it to you. I want to speak up for nature, he says. You can hear the division in his rhetoric right out of the block. So here, here he goes, okay? So here's my solidarity with Henry in the same space, perhaps. I wish to speak a word for nature, for absolute freedom and wildness, as contrasted with a freedom and culture merely civil. <laughs> okay, so he's really drawing this sharp distinction between civilization and nature, but that's not true. That's, and it's a mistake that we fall into. You know, I went to visit all the national parks. The danger, the temptation of a national park is to think that that's where the nature is, right? Or that's where the beauty is. That's where the sublime is. But Oliver says, no. The sublime is in your literal backyard or in your house, for that matter, right? Even that division is false, right? The yard is nature and your house isn't. And as a matter of fact, you've got all kinds of species living with you in the house. This is like a, a, a new trend that some biologists are looking at domestic biodiversity. You have something like, you know, 17 species of spiders in your basement. And so now these, you know, biologists are going into human domiciles and, and, and charting the biodiversity that we live with. Not to mention our bodies, right? So much of our bodies are other creatures, other DNA. So it's just, it's a lie, and it tricks us into thinking that the way forward is to protect areas like national parks. It's the same problem with the temple, by the way. Great theologians will sound the uh, flood warning bell about this. The danger of setting up a temple is that you seem to be suggesting that this is the sacred space and everything else is profane. It's a way of making a kind of profaning or desecration of the world. That's the danger. It's not necessary to understand it that way, but it is possible. It is a temptation. So same thing with the National Park or a State Park, right? This is where we go, you know, get restored by nature. No, you can go to your basement and study some spiders. <laughs> That's great. There, there's a, I participate in a uh, iNaturalist thing, which is all about the nature in your home. I think it's called Nature in Your Home, and it's all over the world. It's totally fascinating. So thank you for reminding us about that. Oh, Here are uh, two related questions. Um, I'll just start with the first. It says, I walk with a friend who does not connect with nature. Any suggestions on how to enable her, how to appreciate it? And then followed up on that, how can we inspire those pulled by feelings of consumerism or video games and et cetera to come into nature? <laughs> so you get a really good rope and you tie it around the person and then you drag them. Ah, uh, yes. We don't do things that we don't love to do. And so it has to be a lure, you know, it has to be delicious. And so I, I think, you know, you have to start with whatever the person, wherever the person is, what do they love, and then work from there, rather than what you love and try to foist it on someone else, right? That's tough. It is, uh, you know, it reminds me of Silicon Valley parents who don't let their kids use the devices that they're designing and selling, that these are addictive devices. They are designed to be. They're also useful and lovely and exciting, and most of us use them in different ways. And so we have to, we can't just say no, but to, to have confidence, I guess, that the natural world has its delights. I'm often reminded of this story of uh, a rabbi. I don't I remember where this is from, but it's one of those images that just lodges in your mind. It's a rabbi teaching a child the Hebrew alphabet. And the Hebrew alphabet is spread out on a table. And each character, you know, each letter is there. And there's a piece of candy on top of each letter. 
And when the child says the letter, they get the candy, you know. So it's this kind of sweetness that, I mean, there's a way to see that as bribery, you know, and say, you know, that, that, that's not the way to do it. But on the other hand, if you look at it more generously, it's an educational strategy that says we have to associate this with sweetness because that's what we follow. You know, we follow the things that are sweet, that are enjoyable. I mean, look at your own life. You don't do things, at least very often, or you don't want to do things that you don't want to do. So I think the thing to do is to get to know the person you're with. It's always in context. It's always relational. But to build on what their passions and interests are and then go from there. So, for example, I mean, maybe, maybe it is having to do with devices. You know, let's go use our phones and, and find the most amazing little creature we can find. You know? I mean, one of the coolest things you can have in your pocket, by the way, is a little magnifying glass or a little, you know, some, they make these little boxes with a magnifying glass on top so you can get a little bug and take a look at it. You know, I, the other answer to the, that, that question is you got to start early, like a certain person I know named Susie Spickle, who spends a lot of her energy and time inspiring love for the world among young people. And if there's one thing we need more of, is we need more young people who are in love with the living world. A great deal depends on that over the next few decades. So to invest in young people, I think, is another way to go at that question so that you're not trying to swim upstream after the addiction has set in. And I, you know, I say that, you know, myself included, we're all addicted to, to something. So. Thank you, Matt. That was sweet. Thank you for acknowledging the work that the Harris Center does um, for young people. Thank you. Um, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Um, so I am curious, um, and this is in some other of the other questions too, is not all communities are really designed for walking, and not all places are walkable by all people. So can you talk a little bit about what kind of infrastructure or kind of structural changes we could make to our communities to encourage people to walk more often? Yeah, that's good. So it's a great question. Um, some of you may know Jeff Speck, uh, who wrote a book called The Walkable City. We just had him come to Keene and give a talk there about how to make Keene more walkable, because you may know we're designing our sort of downtown area. Um, for me, the real question when we're thinking about infrastructure, you know, that's one way into the question, is to say, I mean, it's just unconscionable, if I can you know, pound the pulpit for a second, how much of our physical built environment is based on the car. It's a deep and profound mistake that we've made. And I understand why we made it. When we started to build this out, you know, the suburbs and the parking lots and the roads, it seemed, you know, I can kind of get myself into that mindset and understand, okay, I see, you know, we didn't understand climate change, we didn't understand, but surely we could have seen at least some of these things coming. But the flip side of that, not just to rant, but the flip side is to say, okay, so what should we start with? And I think we should start with the human walker. And that expansive definition of walking needs to be in our minds, including wheelchairs and, and, and walkers and canes and everything else and bare feet, to include the whole gamut. And then to say, how would we build communities? And so some of this is not new to you, but it's still worth repeating that part of what we need to ask is, who are we? What do we need? We need to eat. We need shelter. We need to be able to walk to the things that we need. And so to take a look at, this is very challenging because of the way we built everything out, but to look at our communities with that in mind and see where are, where's the fresh food, not the convenience store food, but fresh food and, and grocery stores, and then look at zoning in the community and where can we encourage and invest so that there's fresh food that everyone in this community can walk to. And then one of the things Jeff Speck talks about is he talks about people crave refuge and prospect. So we, we, we crave protection, but also a view. So when a lot of us have these like ideal pictures of an urban or a, or a village or a town, we might think of like a village in Tuscany, you know, these, these photographs, right? They're trying to get you to come to Tuscany. So it's like this kind of narrow street with like three stories on either side and they're colorful and they have flower boxes and they're stone and it's cobblestone and you can see some mountains in the distance. So Jeff Speck says, yeah, that's refuge because you've got those, those walls there and prospect. 
So we need to ask, okay, what opportunities do we have for refuge and prospect? I would add waterfront, because we crave waterfront. Peterborough, you know, not to falsely flatter Peterborough, but Peterborough's pretty impressive in this way. There are these moments as you walk around town of refuge, prospect, and that waterfront development. So in Keene, some of you may know the Jonathan Daniels uh, Trail, which is right along the Ashwilet River. The Ashwilet River is the reason we have Keene in the first place. You know, the river is so important, and yet we turn our backs on it. A lot of, a lot of communities turn our backs on the rivers because, you know, they're not useful to us anymore. But, of course, they're great places to walk. So can we build accessible walking paths? And we have, you know, some of that in Keene, but can we capitalize on that? South of West Street, if you know Keene, there isn't much uh, waterfront or riverfront walking. Could we develop that? Could we extend the Jonathan Daniels uh, path? Could we think about water? So it's water, refuge, and prospect. But to ask the questions in the first place, what kind of, human, what kind of being is the human being? We need to eat. We love refuge. We love prospect. We love water. And how can we make our cities more walkable? But for those of you who are interested, Jeff Speck's work is really good on this. Uh, asking all the kinds of questions that you would ask about the politics and the, the pragmatics to make sure that walking can be the enterprise and adventure of the day. Last thing I'll say, Rich, Rachel Carson says, Rachel Carson, the great Rachel Carson, she says, some of the best times to walk are in the rain. So we can, <laughs> the world sparkles in a special way. So we can be inspired by Rachel as we go into this beautiful day. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you again, Matt, for sharing your thoughts with us today. We hope you've enjoyed today's live broadcast of the Monadnock Summer Lyceum. Thank you for your support for our 2023 season. There will be no Lyceum next week because it is McDowell Medal Day. Please join us in two weeks to hear Jerry Ann Bogus, whose talk is entitled Out of the Shadows, Remembering New Hampshire's Black Past. Now please join us for an informal reception in the parish hall through the door to my right. There you will have the opportunity to engage in further conversation with our speaker and to enjoy cold drinks. Thank you.